Hey everyone, my name is John Grimsmo. Welcome to another edition of Fixture Fridays, which is a term I just made up, but it is Friday. In our last video, part one of this series, we uh, got the new orange vices in, we got the fixtures in from Amish, my buddy. Um, and as promised, in this video, we're going to go deeper in depth with the code that we're gonna be using in order to use these fixtures, and hopefully I can explain some of that to you guys. But for now, here is some footage from my friend Amish making these fixtures on his DMG Mori DMU50 monoblock, something like that. It's a nice big fancy five axis machine. Check it out. So I've spent the past week trying to figure out how to handwrite the code. It's like a main code that calls all the subroutines and all the macros that does all the logic required to make this code work. So basically right now I have two orange vices on the table right now. We could put two fixtures on. I want the probe and the machine to go, is there a fixture here? Yes or no? Right now it would be no. Move over. Is there a fixture here? No. It should move on. Is there an engraving palette here? No, it should finish. And everything works great. I tested it right now with nothing in. Like I'll show you, I've got coolant. If you see right here, the coolant light is flashing. Um, that means it's off, so it's never gonna turn on. Anyway, so right now it's probing. Is there a palette? Is there a palette? Checking, and it needs to see two inches here, and it doesn't. So now it's gonna go to the next one. The funny thing I realized though, as I ran this just a minute ago, is that the next part of the logic is timed a little bit wrong. Right now it should just say, oh, there's nothing there, move on. But it doesn't. It's actually, I've got an M00. So the way I've got the code structured, which I didn't realize until just now, but it's going through every tool and it's just turning it on, stopping it, and then moving to the next tool, turning it on, stopping it. And all they need to do is move some of the logic to be above the tool call so that it just moves on completely. Um, at the end of the day, it's not a big deal, but it's quite inefficient because now it's doing all of this for absolutely no reason. But I can fix that. Um, however, the code absolutely works. And I've been debugging it and finding brackets that I forgot and all, this, all these mistakes. Uh, you just kind of go through it and you try to figure it out. But it's working. So I think right now, we're gonna to try to load two pallets, or at least attempt and see if it works. So we put up a video uh, a week or two ago about some of the macros that we're working on here. And um, the response has been absolutely phenomenal. Like I've gotten emails and comments and messages and DMs on Instagram where guys are speaking up about macro programming going, I do that too, or I do that too. And I've found it, I found it difficult to find a lot of information out there. I mean, there is information, but I don't exactly hear a lot of people talking about it all the time. And I actually find it very difficult to talk about because it's so technical and boring in a way. And you know, unless I sit down with you and like run through every line of code and explain things, I feel like all I can do is gloss over it. Um, so the response has been awesome. So maybe we should go a bit deeper. Maybe we should dive 
uh, a little bit deeper into some of the topics that we're doing, the how and the why and the what, and uh, show you guys what this is capable of. Because, I mean, my new favorite book is, it's huge. It's like, it's transforming the way that we run this machine and of course the lay-in as well. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. I like this kind of stuff. And the messages that I'm getting are like, whoa, you like it too, that's awesome. Yeah, so if you guys are interested in hearing more about this kind of stuff, I'm happy to share, but it takes some thought and some effort to be able to explain it properly in a way that makes sense. But let us know in the comments uh, and maybe we'll see what we can do. So my entire learning process is, I wanna do that. Let me figure it out. So it's trial and error, and trial and error, and error, and error, and error, and error, and error. Make a lot of mistakes, make a lot of progress. And then as long as you learn from your mistake, it's totally fine. Um, so another part of this, this whole programming recipe that I wanna to talk to you guys about is, so if you look at the screen here, or the control panel, we've got a memory button and we've got a DNC button. Now this is a FANUC machine. FANUC is the control type. Um, the memory side, let me get this right here. It is used free 500 megabytes. Is that right? 500 megabytes. So that's half a gig. You can't even buy a USB stick that small anymore. It is such a minuscule amount of data. And if you put any kind of a big program on the memory side, um, it'll fill up the memory side and you can't run it. Like you can't actually do it. So Mori has this DNC side, which gives you a two gigabyte hard drive, which is great. I'm uh, ba -ba -ba, free disk space. I have a lot of space left, sorry. I have a lot of space left there. Um, and I have a lot of big programs on there. Never gonna fill it up, that's awesome. The problem is we run everything from DNC, all our big files, like 400,000 lines of code, um, does an entire palette, everything. But from the DNC side, you can't do all the fun logic that you can do in here. If, if then, go to, while, do, things like that. So if it probes and it goes, if there's a palette there, do this. You can't do that from the DNC side. So I've had to figure out these ways to like hack the code to say, if this, go to the memory side, do some logic, and then come back. Now, the way we're doing the programs here is I'm writing a master program in the memory side, which is not very long. It's like a thousand lines of code, I think. And then it's calling up the huge file in the DNC side, which is my Norseman palette. So it's doing all the logic on the memory side. It's going into the DNC to grab the big file, run it, and then return and then a little bit more logic, and then it'll move over, you know, nine inches or whatever it is until the next pallet, re reach into the DNC, grab that file again, run it through, and then if it's successful at the end, it'll back into the memory side and do that for as many pallets as it needs. So that's part of the logic that I'm trying to figure out right now. Um, there are issues reaching from one hard drive to the next, and you gotta get all the settings right, and it's been a challenge, but uh, I love a good challenge. What we did here, I made this palette, Amish made the four new ones that we're gonna be using. Um, I based it off of the orange palette layout with this, uh, I forget what degree that is, 45 degree dovetail or something, uh, four locating pins. Now, the way that the orange vices come standard is with these half inch dowel pins that are threaded on one side. So if they get stuck in your fixture, you can screw in a bolt and then pull it out. Um, the problem with these is they either stick in the palette or they stick in the vise 
and like two will stick and the other will come out on the other piece and they're they're super annoying so I created these a while ago that is basically the same thing except threaded on one side and I used some really stupid thread it's it's half inch diameter by metric uh, 1.5 millimeter thread like I've made it up kind of dumb to be able to use two at the same time but it works pretty awesome so these guys thread into the fixture they locate pretty well I made a whole bunch of them they thread in they're nice and tight I should have put a little flathead or a torx drive or something on it so we can get a tool in there keep them tight now to all you trolls out there what I'm doing is not exactly by the book for GDNT blah 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 I'm using four pins what they say is that you're supposed to only use two pins for locating, one round pin and one diamond-shaped pin, um, because there's always positional um, inaccuracy in, in everything, whatever. I find that four pins, slightly undersized, works perfectly. They go on, the pallet doesn't jiggle too much. I'm not making aerospace parts, although we're trying to make it as good. Um, I just find that this works so good. It's just simple. So, I've got four pins on there. They go onto the pallet. Um, if you see the pallet here, it's got these two there, two there. It's got a bunch in the middle that you can use for various different things. Put the pallet on. Doesn't jiggle, doesn't go on. I want it to go on, you know, easily enough. Um, notice how sh short these are. They don't stick out very far. The way that the orange pallets are is these stick out probably I don't know, that far. So you have to lift the pallet up that much more to be able to get it off. I made these really shallow, really short, and fully radiused on the top so that they just plop on really nice and easily. Because I want this to be easy to install. And then when you tighten this guy, there we go. I don't need it super tight. Um, we have played with a torque wrench here, and we need to buy a, a dedicated torque wrench, actually, because we've noticed, <coughs> because of the way, because of the way this pallet is designed, right, it's super weak in the middle. It's thin right in the middle. And because you're doing the dovetail here and here, imagine if underneath this pallet, I'm gripping it from here to here, and that thing's got a lot of force, so as you tighten it, this pallet literally just wants to bow up right in the middle. Not a great thing. Because I've got this weak spot, this cutout right in the middle. But we can absolutely make that work by not tightening it too much. So, currently we just have this sort of, uh, you know, feel. Um, we've put an indicator on the top and as you tighten more you can actually see it move up by a thou or two thou or whatever. So, we've got to get a torque wrench. <coughs> so that we can find the optimal uh, torquening, torquening tightness. Side note, we did end up buying this tiny little Tekton torque wrench from Amazon. Uh, I love this thing. I did a lot of research actually to find a very small torque wrench, not one of those huge automotive ones. Um, this measures in inch pounds and we put a uh, Torx Plus driver on the tip of it. So we're using this to tighten um, our blade portions right here because I think we've had a little tiny bit of slipping from these screws so I love this thing it's about $65 or something Canadian um, it's really good I like it a lot because otherwise we're relying on the battery power because uh, we usually go like this set it to 13 14 whatever and then we tighten everything like that for most of the screws it works great but imagine if the battery starts dying Imagine if you start getting a little bit less power. Maybe it's not going to tighten quite as much. So we're starting now to torque like very specific things that, uh, that can't be wrong. So I like that. So this screen here is our macro variables. And there's about, I don't know, 600 maybe? I'm using uh, probably Baruti of them to do this whole pallet thing. So for example here, if you can read this, 654, 5, 6, and 7 tells me is pallet 1 on, is pallet 2 on, and a 1 is a yes, a, a, Z, a nothing is a no, or anything other than 1 is a no. 
So right now, I'm going to cheat it and tell it that palette 1 and palette 2 are on, even though, as you can see, only palette 2 is on. And the goal, of course, is 3 and 4 over here. So I'm going to cheat it and tell it that. I'm going to go back to my code. I'm going to run it from there. And if my calculations are correct, um, it's going to do a quick little, not that. My calculations were not correct. So the problem is because I'm trying to cheat it right now. Ah, got it. Total pallets on the machine says zero, but let's cheat it and say that there's two. That's what I missed. So I've got pallet one is on, pallet two is on, but I forgot that total pallets thought it was zero. So let's try that now. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a simple operation that lets me visually see that it's cycling through the code. So I'm just going to there. Yes, that was pallet one. Now it should loop to pallet two and do the same thing. Boom. Okay, and then it should rewind and then change to the probe and then move over to the engraving fixture. Yes. And then it says there's no pallet there, so it's going to move on. So right now it's using logic and macros to be, you know, the pallet should be three inches taller. So it goes, oh, obviously nothing's there. So I created that little code with the fan just to be able to visually see, yes, it went to pallet one, yes, it went to pallet two, not to three, not to four, and it moved on to the engraving. So if I just replace that fan operation with my entire pallet code, it should work. That's the theory. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. Uh, in the upcoming video, part three, hopefully we'll be able to test out the code, make sure it works, and get everything dialed in. Uh, cross your fingers for us. Uh, thanks for watching. Take care.